Welcome to Church in the Home. We are so glad that you are able to join us this morning. And how wonderful that we will be able to meet together in person next Sunday to farewell Wayne and Roz, but more about that later. I hope you're able to listen to Howard's songs this morning that he has chosen to allow the spirit to minister to you, that you are able to worship and to enter into today's message, the theme of being confident in God, to help us when we really, that he can help us when we need him. I'm going to read from Psalm 27 and hear David's words about this very topic. And then I'll hand over to Baden, who's going to bring the children's message. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from my Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me at his sacred tent, and I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call. Lord, be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God, my saviour. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in your straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Amen. Baden. Thank you, Julie. Today for the Kids Spot, we'll be looking at the story of David and Goliath. Now, in your activity booklets, there's a Bible verse that you can read along with, but today's story and reading will be coming out of best loved Bible stories. This story is called, God Chooses a Shepherd. The Israelites were fighting the Philistines, and David's brothers were a part of the army. Take some food out to your brothers, said Jesse, David's father. When David reached the camp where the soldiers stayed, he asked, how's the battle going? Before anyone could answer, a shout rang across the valley. There, on the other side of the valley, stood a giant yelling, send a man to fight me. If he kills me, the Philistines will leave. If I kill him, you will all be our slaves. David looked at the soldiers. They were afraid. Why doesn't someone go out to fight this man? Asked David. Be quiet, said one of his brothers. Are you trying to show off? No one can fight this man. He is a giant. But David would not be quiet. I'm not trying to show off, he said. I will fight him. When King Saul heard that, he put on a big suit of armour on David. I can't fight in this, said David. I must fight the way I know how to, with my sling and God on my side. Goliath was angry. Am I a dog that a boy comes out to fight me with a sling? 
But David quietly put a stone in his sling. He whirled it around and around and around. Then the stone flew through the air and hit Goliath smack in the forehead. The giant fell to the ground dead and the Israelites were free. This story comes from 1 Samuel 16 to 17. But what you'll see in the activity booklet today, something I want to leave you with right now. How could a mere boy kill this great giant? What was the secret of David's strength and courage? Anyway, guys, that's it for the kids spot today. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you next time. Here's Wayne. Good morning and uh, welcome to church as we've already been welcomed. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, Baden, for the message of David and Goliath. It's such a powerful story, isn't it? And uh, as I thought about what to say today, I looked up the lectionary of all things. And when I saw this passage, I thought that's too good to leave sitting on the page. And so I've entitled this message, Growing in Faith to Face Giants with Confidence. And that word confidence, confide, with faith, in the Latin derivation, con fide, with faith. So in addressing this issue of confidence, I want to uh, say it's been very significant for me all my life. And uh, confidence has been something that I've struggled with um, uh, as a young guy and uh, into adulthood. And uh, I guess anxiety and the sort of insecurity goes along with confidence. And yet I recognise that confidence is so key to achieving things, to bearing fruit in our lives and uh, to finding satisfaction in our faith. Confidence and expectation of God, that God will turn up and do what he says. So confidence and faith are inextricably uh, linked. As a young youth minister in my Nidri days, I had the opportunity to hang out at the local high school, something that's not so simple these days, but where the principal gave me permission to be amongst kids, to just uh, gather those who have Christian faith or just encourage kids, be there to help kids in, in need. And on the first day there, I met a young student who befriended me. He was quite outgoing and that made it easy. And he took me to a classroom where a few of his mates were hanging out during the lunch break and we chatted a bit. But my memory of this is that I fairly soon withdrew from that context and just sort of went with this uh, guy and focused on the one-to-one, which I felt more comfortable with. But nothing really eventuated from that relationship with that guy or his mates. And I realised later that I had missed a real God opportunity that God had set up for me partly through a lack of God awareness and expectation that God had gone there before me, and partly through a lack of personal confidence and staying in my own comfort zone rather than stepping out of that and trusting God uh, in that context. So in this I can identify with the men of Israel in David's time as as Goliath got up there on the hill and uh, cried out, fee fi fo fum, I'm going to have some Israelites for breakfast and lunch or whatever it was he was saying along those lines and uh, they uh, were um, shaking in their boots and I imagine King Saul all all the more so because he was the tallest of the people in Israel and the obvious contender to take on Goliath. So a lack of confidence and a lack of courage, the two very much hand in hand. David stands out in stark contrast Here again, the words with which he addresses Saul. He says, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. No hesitation or doubt at all. And when Saul says that he can't do it, David says, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who, defied me, who delivered me from the poor of the lion and the poor of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. 
What amazing words of confidence, confidence in God and of indignation that anyone should seek to stand up and oppose God and God's people. I would love to have that sort of confidence, wouldn't you? Think of what we could do with that sort of faith, that sort of a big picture of God that would overwhelm the sort of giants that we face in our day and our time. What sort of giants am I talking about? What sort of giants are you facing? And of course, Rick Warren uh, is quoted by Nicky Gumbel in talking about the challenges that we face in life by saying he used to think life was full of sort of times of hard things, of challenges, and then times of peace and sort of blessing. But now he's come to see both happen in parallel, that we live with challenges and trials and blessings in parallel at the same time, and yes, to different and varying degrees. And I believe that's quite true. So while we might say, and I believe in a, anyone who lives in Australia is blessed simply by that fact, we live with an orderly government, a strong health system, with comparative wealth in our country, many blessings. But in the midst of that, even at the moment, the world is facing the trial, the giant of COVID, aren't they? And the loss of income for many people, the isolation, the loss of access to grandchildren, to family, to friends, uh, the emotional struggle and the mental illness uh, that's exacerbated in such circumstances, and uh, fears of, of contacting uh, the disease. So many challenges, let alone the further giants of conflict within families and within marriage, uh, financial loss, uh, emotional concerns, decisions that might seem too difficult to face, griefs, the loss of loved ones in these circumstances. What sort of giants are you facing at this time? Maybe even the giant of facing an injustice in the world that you're seeking to address or issues of climate change, or um, you know, child slavery, and maybe causes that you really want to address but seem overwhelming. There's all sorts of giants uh, that we can be confronted by. Well, what do we learn from David and his approach to Goliath? Because David was the runt of the litter. He was the eighth in a, a family of, of many sons, the youngest and uh, the one least uh, likely in many ways, out looking after the sheep, playing his lyre, a little sort of small harp, and composing songs and prayer songs while he looked after the sheep munching the grass. He had plenty of time, it would seem, to while away and to reflect. And in that time, there were high times of heightened adrenaline when suddenly out of nowhere there would be a lion or a bear attacking the sheep, and he would suddenly spring into action and uh, bravely defend the sheep and attack and even kill, as we've heard, uh, these fierce animals. So David learned in, quote, in the quiet and in the, the rush of blood that God was faithful and God was there with him, always his companion and rescuer and deliverer. So David had plenty of time to get to know God and to nurture his love of the word of God, which comes out in his psalm, Psalms 119, which is all about his love for the word, and Psalm 19, where he talks about the word being sweeter than honey, honey from the comb, and uh, even sweeter maybe than, than uh, Paul's honey that he, he um, uh, manufactures from his bees. Just last week, one of our uh, Saturday morning prayer group believed God was saying to them that God was saying... Uh, that we, we needed to linger with God. Not necessarily extending that prayer time beyond the usual hour, but as a principle, as a practice, to linger with God, to spend unrushed, unhurried time with him. And uh, I believe that's what David had. That was part of the secret to his confidence in God, that he spent time meditating on God's word, which he'd laid up in his heart applying that word to the various concerns in his mind, reflecting, uh, journaling mentally, even if not literally, although he wrote songs. So he was, in a sense, his songs are his prayer journal, the Psalms that we have access to now. So, so much of this secret life that David had in this quiet place, referred to in the Psalm that Julie read for us, 
One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That is in God's very presence. And again, he talks about God hiding him up high upon a rock in the day of trouble. And he knew troubles as the animals, fierce animals attacked. David even says words that amaze me, that even though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. What amazing words. And David knew warfare uh, by the time he wrote uh, these other psalms. Have you ever wondered why uh, David, when preparing to fight Goliath, he refused the armour of Saul, he didn't sort of try and fit into someone else's model of how they solved a problem, he didn't go racing out to harass others to get ideas to concoct a plan, but he went to a stream and chose five smooth stones. Now why did he do that when he would have known that one stone needed to strike its mark because if that missed he was dead meat there was no time for a second or a third or certainly not a fifth stone but as one writer suggested that i read years ago there was a chance for david just to still his heart before god and to seek god's counsel and commit his cause to god in prayer to linger as it were in god's presence no doubt, even though his confident speech, there would have been a, a surge of adrenaline, a fluttering of the heart as he faced this uh, giant. And it's at a point like that where maybe all of us have known that same sense of anxiety before a challenge that we face, that there can be this sense of panic almost come up to us. And if we let loose with that, if we let that run its course, we become paralysed, don't we, from actually doing the thing and facing the challenge. And we can withdraw in fear, as uh, in my early days I found myself uh, doing. <clears throat> Are you familiar with such moments? Have you learned the discipline of stilling your anxious thoughts and racing panic-inclined heart at times to linger, to pray? to praise God with thanksgiving, to place your cares in the hands of the one who loves you beyond your wildest dreams. There is much at stake so that we need to do this. As there was with David, the whole nation and their welfare was at stake. And there's a lot at stake with how we respond to the challenges that we face, more than we often would be aware of. So David strengthened himself in the Lord, in this quiet place. There's another element uh, to David which Peter Scazzaro draws out in the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course, and that is David's self-awareness. David knows his own capacities. He knows from experience what he's capable of, of doing, and he doesn't uh, lose that knowledge. He remembers and calls this to mind. There's no false humidity or false humility or false modesty about David. Nor does David allow a narrative of self-talk in his head to be influenced by his older brothers. Notice, and you might relate to this as, as, I, will, as I certainly do, that older brothers can sometimes be a pain. Sometimes younger brothers can be. And these older brothers were having a go at David. What are you doing here? You spoil sport, you little squirt. You're just here for the show. You want to see some blood and gore and some action. You know, get back home and where the sheep are. You know, that's all you're good for was the, the in, inference. And uh, his brothers were having a go at him, particularly his oldest brother. And uh, David just didn't take that on. Now, how about you? Uh, what about me? Uh, I remember in my sort of early days, teen years, childhood years, some of those things really struck home in sibling sort of bullying and persecution that happens in big families as ours was. And, uh, you know, people get picked on for different things. And uh, those relationships within our family of origin can be determining. In fact, they frequently are determining of, of the narrative we run in our head about who we are and what we're capable of doing. And we can uh, talk ourselves out of things that we're actually capable of and opportunities that are presented to us. And uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be aware of, of the sort of self-talk and narrative that you run in your minds. 
Well, for me, uh, there was a, a season in which uh, some brothers who I get on really well now with, I might say, and things have, and we've had chance to talk about the dynamics of our family that led to this thing, but seasons of cutting words that caused me to really doubt myself and doubt my, the integrity of my motives and to feel that I was just incapable uh, and not worthwhile. Uh, through words that were, were said in a bullying fashion and sometimes the intimidation of physical bullying that led, uh, engendered fear. And these things stayed with me further beyond uh, what I um, ever understood. So how does one grow through these things? Well, that's, uh, I guess, uh, a number of things and we'll each, who knows which are the most determining, but prayer ministry was very powerful for me in the early days through the Holy Spirit revealing in a context of prayer with other people seeking God on my behalf and uh, where the Spirit revealed things that I had blotted out of my mind and really blotted out of my memory and to recognise their significance in holding me in fear and also in hindering my relationship uh, with those certain members of my family that have since uh, been addressed um, in, a, in a very constructive and, and fruitful way which I, I praise God for. But uh, the, the affirmation of people within the body of Christ, uh, the word of God and its encouragement to trust God, not rely on our own insight, but to trust him in all our ways and he will make straight our paths. And uh, that word about not having any anxiety, but in everything by prayer, with thanksgiving, to let our request be made known to God. The word of God has the power to change the narrative in our head, the self-talk, as we start to meditate on the word of God in the very... Uh, moment and context of, of those emotions of fear and panic and anxiety that are triggered. And that's been a, a discipline I've, ha I've had to exercise for in desperation and for survival uh, to be able to do what God's called me to do. And that as, as we do that step out in obedience to God's word, in faith, in courage, in little things, so we start to get little stones like monuments uh, that we can draw on, just as David drew on his background experience with the bear and the lion to deal with this Goliath. So we can draw on those instances where God comes through when we trusted him, where the thing we fear didn't happen, that we can trust God then in the bigger event and we can continue to trust God and think, hey, my experience now is different to the narrative that I used to run with. And so we start to create through the word of God and through the prayer and affirmation and experience within the house and household of God a different narrative. And that's what David, uh, what gave him that confidence in this intimidating circumstance. So an event occurred some years back that was a real turning point for me and a contrast to my early days. And uh, which I've mentioned, I think, on one occasion here, and that was when I was in the Yarra Valley uh, in ministry there and a, a fairly young minister amongst a well-established group of other ministers in the churches throughout the valley and they'd planned a, uh, an outreach with uh, the, jo the God Squad amongst the schools. At least they envisaged having such an outreach but planning had not gone very far. And uh, one of the voices there was raised saying, look, we can't go ahead with this. There's not enough time to put it together in any effective fashion and we can't do it half-baked and uh, really let's shelve this idea. And, uh, you know, people were discussing this back and forth and it was thinking, wow, this is not going anywhere. And something rose up within me at this point uh, when I didn't normally speak in this uh, gathering in, in, in a very uh, initiating way. But I remember that I'd been involved in such um, missions with John Smith and the God Squad in schools I'd been involved with in my youth work days. And something rose up to say, look, we can do this. It's, it's not so difficult. And uh, so I spoke up and said, look, let's give this a go. Let's, God's uh, with us. I, I've had some experience in this. And another one of the fellows there uh, said, yeah, let's do this. And he partnered with me. And together we split up the valley into two halves and we organised and uh, put this in motion. And uh, John Smith came in and spoke in the classrooms, to the, that is to the staff rooms rather, in the primary schools. And we had members of the God Squad team uh, doing seminars with senior students in the, second, in the primary schools and, and some work in uh, the few secondary schools in that area. And uh, God did wonderful things uh, in terms of just creating that conversation, that faith uh, gossiping the gospel 
and faith talk uh, opened up in those schools. And I believe that was instrumental the following year through another God encounter when I had the opportunity to join with principals who were exploring with Access Ministries uh, to have chaplains in primary schools, which was unprecedented at that time and way before the National uh, School Chaplaincy Funding that uh, the government the later brought in place. And we ended up, with, you know, over a couple of years, of having some six or so chaplains part-time in 13 or so schools throughout the valley. And uh, that was a powerful fruit of a number of things happening, and I think a small part of that was the fact that we went ahead at a turning point when there were voices saying, don't act on this. And I think David in particular, so much uh, flowed from his obedience to God and his courage at that point. David was a man after God's own heart. And uh, David's and Goliath, that story, as you look at the whole Old Testament, is really the hinge on which the Old Testament turns. And I say that because if you look beforehand, you have the book of Judges, with all that uh, depressing, like the dark ages, where the people had no king and did what they saw fit in their own eyes. And you get it, it, corruption and idolatry and uh, terrible degradation. And then you get that beautiful little story of Ruth and Boaz and Naomi. And it really seems to be just a curtain raiser because at the end of that story we learn that Ruth, uh, her children, her child was Obed, who's was the father of Jesse, was the father of David. And the book really serves to introduce David into the picture. And the story of David and Goliath is where David emerges into public notice and becomes a treasured part of Saul's uh, household and becomes a commander in his army. And it ultimately becomes the king. And becomes, uh, through his prophetic nature and his priestly uh, caricature, that he becomes a type that later prophets refer to because God promised David that he would always have a king on the throne uh, for generations and everlasting. And later prophets interpreted that, that there would be the Messiah, the anointed one, anointed by the Holy Spirit, not just the oil of kingship, but the Holy Spirit, such that David was anointed with, but in fuller measure and in a greater way to bring deliverance to the people of Israel from their sins and even from death, as we discover through the fulfilment of that prophecy, the person of Jesus. And so David's obedience there uh, to stand up and his courage against Goliath, in a way, prepared the way for the rest of the Old Testament expectation of the Messiah and was fulfilled ultimately in Jesus. Fruit and consequence way beyond uh, David's imagining because of the way that David, uh, God shaped David's faith in him, in that quiet place, that place of lingering uh, by the sheep, uh, in that uh, isolation of shepherding. What might God be preparing you for amidst the giants that you currently face and even greater giants in the future that he's preparing you to confront in an incredible confident faith in God for the deliverance and the saving of many lives, for the coming to faith of many others, whether that be in the context of your family and your extended family where there may be great challenges, maybe relationship breakdowns that you're called to be a peacemaker within the family, to be an intercessor, to be one who maybe uh, speaks into hope and encouragement into the next generation where there's a lack of hope or where there's discouragement. What might God be purposing to do through you in your workplace? in your neighbourhood, in your community organisation, as he places you maybe in a role of influence, that you have no idea what's coming uh, that's required of that organisation or that role within the, your season that you are actually in that role. For such a time as this, don't, don't be like me in those early days, blind to a God opportunity through lack of expectation, through lack of a knowledge of God for whom nothing is random, nothing is by accident, because he is shaping your destiny and your purpose. And not only each one of us individually, but what might happen when a community of faith such as Christ Church Dingley devotes itself to seeking God and to going after God at a deeper level to, for their hearts to be fashioned by God.
in love and care for one another, in generosity, in devotion to God's word, in response to emergencies such as that in the Dandenongs, where our bishop is saying, how can we help? How can different churches assist? Where we might have the courage to be involved in what God is putting on our heart as a community with our kids' hope in the our school and other such ventures that we might fulfil the prophetic words spoken about this church to be a beacon in the darkness, to be a source of refreshment and healing to a needy world. What might you do to be part of, of, of that movement of God for such a time as this? When, yes, we face uncertainty, we face change, we face an unknownness of what the future brings, except that we will see the goodness of, the, of God in the land of the living, for Christ Church Dingley and through Christ Church Dingley to a world that needs our Lord and Saviour. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray that you would put in our hearts such a longing, a thirst and a hunger and a readiness to linger with you, to linger and to delve into your word and allow it to soak into the very fibres of our being, to allow you through your Holy Spirit to strengthen us with a, a knowledge of your love as revealed through Jesus and in your word, to allow a different narrative to take shape in our mind and our spirit as your word uh, shapes our thinking and as we approach the various challenges, the small things, through a confidence in you that grows from the small to the large. Lord, help us to seek you in both the secret place and in the company of your people for such a time as this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, you love us perfectly, just as we are. And we thank you for your perfect love, given to us through your Son, Jesus, our Saviour and our Lord. And because we are loved, we can come before our Heavenly Father with confidence that you hear our prayers and that you are working all things together for the good of those who love you, who are called according to your purpose. We pray for the world that you created, our world that you have placed us in. Guide us, Lord, to be better stewards of all that has been provided to us. May we be mindful of our footprint, how we live on this earth, your earth, what we consume, what we discard, what we use, how we use it and how we live in the world that you said was good. Give wisdom to us all and to those in authority in every land and give to all peoples the desire for righteousness and peace and the will to work together in trust, to seek the common good and to share with justice the resources of this earth. Forgive us, Lord, when we have not been good stewards and we have forgotten to be thankful for all that we have. We pray for everyone affected by the COVID pandemic, for those on the front line, the doctors and nurses and health workers, and for everyone behind the scenes trying to bring an end to this horrible virus. We lift before you all those who are suffering, particularly the countries and communities who are struggling under the weight of this sickness. Lord, we pray for miracles. We pray for people to have hope where they see only obstacles and despair. O oh Lord, may you make a way where there seems no way. We pray for all those affected by the storms last week, particularly those who are still without power, those whose homes have been badly damaged, and for all those tireless workers who are out and about fixing and restoring and doing amazing things, particularly the volunteers. Keep them all safe, Lord, we pray. 
Lord, we pray for our community and our church, for your hand to be upon our leaders, particularly Wayne, Tanya, Baden, upon our office staff, all our members, and upon each ministry, as we all seek to serve you wholly and faithfully in all that we do. We especially lift before you the incumbency committee and the search for our new vicar. Guide them to the servant that you have chosen for us and particularly be with Tanya and our locum Alex as they serve us and lead us and work with all of us together for the better, betterment of our church here in Dingley. Lord, we pray for your people. May your love touch every person that needs to know that they are loved. Those who struggle to know your hand of love, your heart of love in their own lives. We think of the loved ones who do not know you, for those struggling to face each day, for those who are tired and worn out, for those who feel hopeless and helpless, for those who are angry, those who are sad. We think of those who grieve and for those who seemingly have given up. Oh God, you are the God of love. You are gracious and merciful. Pour your love into all those that we have brought to you in prayer. Breathe your spirit into them and where and when necessary, use us as your servants to show them your love. And may we all have the confidence to pray together your prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now Wayne will bring the notices and what's happening next week. Hello. Thanks, Julie. Good on you. Well, these are very uh, uh, interesting times, aren't they? And uh, we haven't been knowing from week to week just what's going to be happening. Uh, but at least uh, we're thankful for the further opening up of the a number of people who are able to come to a church service, though still with the four square metre spacing. So next week, the 27th of June, uh, we're having two services here in person, but both in the auditorium uh, to enable us to have larger numbers. We can fit 75 people into each of those two services using the atrium and the foyer for overflow and uh, preserving the spacing. After the 8.30 time there, there'll be a time of uh, morning tea, a special uh, time together as a church community. And then 10.30, there'll be a lunch following that as well. Now, we can only have uh, 75 people inside the building uh, for that at each one. It's 150 all up. So you need to register um, prior to that. Those who haven't registered won't be able to enter in. And if you're not sure how to do that, then find someone who can help you uh, with that, or ring the office, but priority is to use the link that was in last Thursday's email. And uh, you can register directly through that link or ask someone else to register you if they're more, if they have access to um, online uh, capacity. Uh, failing that, you can ring the office, um, but prefer people to do their own registering. So that's what's happening and um, it's going to be a special time for us as a church uh, family. Uh, I want to finish um, with the benediction and uh, just encourage you to read your email from which I haven't written yet as we're filming this, but you'll get it on Thursday and that'll include some information from our bishop, how we can assist in the Dandenongs uh, with the um, storm damage that's been so devastating to so many homes there. So go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage, hold fast that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, 
help the afflicted. Give honour to all, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always, now and forever. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.